we're talking about um, Christianity and psychology, and my topic I was given is seeking truth or feeling better. And I tar- started that last time, and I think my answer was basically some of both. <laughs> um, and I filled that in a bit, but I just want to review a couple of things from last time, and that is that one of the places we started was in understanding um, a definition of happiness, and that um, we have that as a kind of a culturally defined thing in our history of ideas. The Greeks um, thought of it, well, their word would have been eudaimonia, and it had a much fuller, richer definition than um, what we tend to think of as happiness. It included um, the fulfillment of being human that comes from um, basically an understanding or commitment to moral virtue. So there was a a really, there was a lot of depth to um, eudaimonia is this fulfillment. That's that's what happiness is. It's, It's being fully human and um, and there's a moral component to that. Um, the utilitarians came along and said, we've, we've defined happiness instead as the absence of pain or pleasure. And so that's much less um, rich and um, crunchy definition of happiness, and I prefer the, the prior one. And I'm also going to make a lot of assumptions out of that view that that's the goal and that as humans we have a um, a uh, another Greek word a telos that is a direction that we go to become the fullest humans we can become includes a movement toward um, moral goodness and virtue and so that's what being human is really about. And of course, we fail miserably at that. So that's where our suffering comes <laughs> in. <laughs> and so I'm in a switch in this week, um, talk about suffering. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, it's difficult to talk about suffering because it's um, a personal and individual experience that each of us has to navigate. Um, it's what I do in my office is um, work up close with the suffering that I have in my room with the people that I sit with. And that's a very involved process. And so in a setting like this, it feels kind of awkward to me, to be honest, that we're just going to talk about it like it's philosophical. (laughs) Um, And that is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about it philosophically. But I just want to kind of acknowledge that, that this is um, what we're talking about is very individual, very personal, and um, and I think it's helpful to have an understanding or a view of what we believe about suffering because it will come, and when it comes, it won't necessarily make the pain less, but I think it does make it less confusing um, if we can have an understanding of of what we believe about suffering. And suffering, like happiness, has a lot of different definitions and understandings depending on the worldview, the philosophy that you're coming from. So for example, Hinduism might see suffering as the impact of karma, sort of a moral um, uh, uh, consequence of things that we have done wrong perhaps in a different life even. Um, The Buddhists have a frame of suffering that says that all life is suffering and that our attachment to things is what causes that suffering. If we can unattach, then we can find um, happiness, fulfillment. Um, Christianity has a different view of suffering that understands it as um, the result of a broken world um, that, uh, that Jesus came to fix, and uh, his death on the cross uh, will redeem this creation as well as individuals who um, ask for his mercy. So those things, how we interpret our suffering is a big part of um, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, It's certainly a psychological issue. It's also a spiritual issue. So I think that part of what 
we struggle with when we talk about Christianity and psychology is that we live in a culture and a world in which psychology is defined in very secular terms. And so we have cut off ourselves from any understanding of um, who God is in the midst of that, who, um, who we are as human beings in the midst of that. Uh, even things like, I don't know, as I read more and more things, I'm also going to talk about the book of Job, which is oddly enough one of my favorite books. Um, that um, I completely sidetracked myself <laughs> just then. Um, what was I saying? Um, that uh, very secular terms. Yes, thank you. Yes, that um, that even the idea of like dreams being information for us or um, insights that come from odd sources, you know, things like that. That we just we don't go there very much in our culture and even in our Christianity we tend to not go there but I think that one of the things that's helpful in cracking open Christianity and psychology is to understand that we live in a world that is created and designed by a very sovereign good God and um, that the whole creation is imbued with his presence in many ways and so the question of suffering comes out of well if that's the case then you know what the heck <laughs> but um but that's a bit of what we'll be talking about tonight so i want to start with a story um some of you know my story a bit um and my my uh family's story but i want to tell a little bit of that um i had a a brother who died of leukemia when he was eight and my other brother was five and I was two and a half. Um, that uh, tragic loss in my early family, in our young family, had a, a devastating impact on the years that followed, um, as you might imagine. Um, I'm, I want to use this as an illustration in a way of how our different psychologies impact how we respond to suffering in our lives. Bec and my parents are a good example of that because my parents responded very differently to the death of their child. Um, my mother's response was one of, I must have done something so horrible that God would punish me in this way. And she dove into a deep depression for a number of years and could and wrestled str um, mightily she w was not a believer at the time and she would have she was a Christian in terms of like she wasn't um, you know a northern African <laughs> she was a Christian because she lived in America but um, but she um, didn't she wasn't a religious person by any means um, but she definitely saw God as this punishing sort of um, that's how bad she was that he would do that to her and that really imp that belief really impacted her it impacted our family a lot and uh, her depression impacted my growing up years quite significantly um, my father on the other hand had a very different response. He um, he was a hard worker. He uh, had a good career. He was able to take a transfer when my brother Steve was diagnosed. He was able to take a transfer to New York and put my brother into treatment at Sloan Kettering, which is like the best hospital for cancer. This was in the 1950s. It was even true then. And my father did that, moved us to New York, to New Jersey, and he worked Manhattan, and my brother received treatment at Sloan Kettering. And he, his response was, I did everything I could, and it still happened. Um, it's a tragic loss, but it's certainly not my fault. <laughs> you know, so they had a very different response in the sense of, I think his response was more like, um, bad things happen and um, and he was devastated by the loss of his child but he wasn't guilty from it <laughs> um, because he could see himself as having done everything he needed to do so that's an example of two really different responses to the same tragedy um, and so they demonstrate our different psychologies as individuals and how um, and, and also they reflect, in a way, different understandings of who God is. Um, 
my mother over time found Christianity, found faith, um, and found a tremendous amount of healing in the midst of um, understanding who God actually is, <laughs> and also in finding mercy. And I'm going to talk about Job in a minute, and um, and then kind of bring in a little bit more, perhaps some more parallels. Um, another story I'll share just a little bit comes out of my own experience of um, <coughs> a tragedy that I experienced in my 20s when a dear friend of mine was um, was killed uh, by a murderer, was murdered. And... Um, and at the time, I was not a believer. I was a uh, pretty rabid atheist at the time. And the reason I, I share that story is that my response to that tragedy at the time, rabid atheist, was, are you kidding me, God? <laughs> and that's interesting to me <laughs> because I didn't believe in him. But I think... I think what it speaks to is that we have a deep sense of justice, of um, kind of how the world is designed in some way, even if we aren't ready to say what we think <laughs> is true about who God is. You know, it's like it, it shows up in different ways. The other piece of that is that um, my response was anger rather than guilt or um, it wasn't my fault. I actually had a, a bit of it was my fault because of just kind of how it all happened, I took on some of that guilt, even though I wasn't involved, of course. Um, but it kind of speaks to what we do. We, we kind of like try to make explanations and we try to make sense out of things and, and we can go really kind of far off in, especially when we're in pain, we can um, really struggle to stay in the reality I was talking about last time that is such an important piece of of mental health <laughs> is remember if you remember my definition from Scott Peck um, I'll read it again that um, mental health is an ongoing process of dedication to reality at all costs and so when we are in tremendous pain and confusion and suffering it's very difficult. We, we want to make sense of it. We want to create explanations. I think it's just a very natural human response. Um, and so, Job, I hear that this was the discussion today. <laughs> so any input from the, <laughs> from the Gutenberg students is welcome. These two were in the discussion, so they can All right. what we said. Was Jonathan were you there too? Yeah, okay, all right. Right, okay, we have three of you guys. Oh, and Maddie, of course. All right. Uh, okay, so like I said, it's kind of oddly enough one of my favorite books. <coughs> it's written in the form of epic poetry, and um, it's an interesting conversation, series of conversations. Um, of course, if you're probably familiar with the story, but just to say it briefly... Um, the devil, Satan, shows up to God and says, what about that guy? He, he, he's the only reason he likes you is because you're really nice to him, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and uh, God says, nah, I don't think so. You can take it all away because my servant Job, he's, he has faith. You know? So he goes down and gets everything taken away from him. His children are killed. His property is destroyed. He loses everything. His wife turns to him and says, curse God and die. <laughs> like, this is, why do you still like him? <laughs> you know? And um, Job says, shall we accept good from God and not adversity? Um, then Satan comes back to God and says, yeah, yeah, well, because you didn't really let me touch his body, so that's why, you know. So he says, okay, go for it. And Job is afflicted with a terrible skin disease, and he suffers ter terrible physical pain. At this point, he is definitely devastated. And he still says, um, though he slay me, yet will I put my hope in him. Um, crazy, right? <laughs> um, 
But it's also a devastating experience for Job. Job's friends come, these three friends come, and um, a little small piece that's missed often is they sit with him in silence for seven days because they see how much pain he's in. They just sit with him. We could learn from that. <laughs> um, but then they start talking. And I think, I think honestly, in having just reread the book again today, I read it every few years, um, in reading it over again today, it, I hear a sense of Job and his three friends are all four struggling to figure out what, who is this God? What is this that has befallen you? What is the explanation? Again, like I was saying, we so want an explanation, right? And so they come up with all of these different, well, it must be a sin you've done. You know, it must be that you haven't repented right. And Job says, look, I am blameless. I haven't done anything. <laughs> and so that can't be it. And then he kind of defends himself. And then Job gets into this whole big defense about how, I want a hearing in the court of God, <laughs> you know, like, I'll prove to you that I'm blameless. And, and, and then his friends are like, really? I mean, that's kind of a big statement, you know, <laughs> like, um, that's, I don't know if that's completely <laughs> true. Like, even if you haven't done anything wrong, who is blameless before God? You know, they kind of challenge him on that. He gets almost like firmer because uh, it's almost like he's wrestling with them and wrestling with God about like, so what is the explanation? Why would he do this to me? I don't get it. And then this other guy shows up and he's not really well introduced, but I think he's one of the most interesting characters in the book. And I don't know how you say his name, Elihu or Elihu. I've always said it Elihu, so that's what I'll say. Um, and Elihu shows up, he's a young man. And these guys are all old and wise. And he says, I've been quiet because you guys have wisdom and I shouldn't speak but he says but I have to speak and then he he goes into this um, whole thing about how um, Job uh, oh there's also a piece right before Elihu speaks where it says that his friends stopped talking because Job had justified himself and I think it has the sense of like Job was so committed to justifying himself that they gave <laughs> up. <laughs> um, and Job really was working to justify himself before God. And Elihu comes along and says, a um, couple of quotes I'll read from his response. God is mighty, but does not despise men. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. Elihu kind of has this perspective that says, Job, you are not justified before God because no human is. And also, yeah, it's confusing. I think Elihu's um, response is really pretty right on. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, this doesn't make any sense, and, um, but God does what God does, and he is way bigger. His wisdom is beyond us. Um, he doesn't despise men. He's mighty. He's firm in his purpose. He makes them listen. This is an, another interesting statement by Elihu. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. So I think Elihu's, what he's bringing is this idea that there is a level of um, correction involved in this punishment and it in this punishment in this suffering um so in a way um it isn't i don't believe that it's a one-on-one -on -one thing like this is what he did wrong and this is the punishment it doesn't work like that but there is a correction that our suffering can bring about that has to do with our own awareness of our moral failure in whatever context because we fail um, as well as a correction of our view of who God is and who we are. And that's a really big correction that we need over and over and over again. Um, so I think that what Eli El Elihu is saying is that we don't know the purposes of God. Our suffering can point us both to the mystery and to the mercy of God. That that's the, the purpose is that we are pointed to both of these things. Um, I feel like I kind of wanted to read a little bit more of 
Emily Hughes thing. Because interestingly, Ellie Hugh also um, reflects on the creation. And if you know what happens next after Ellie Hugh, God shows up and he speaks for himself. Um, oh, Ellie Hugh also says um, to Job, listen to, to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. So he's, he's turning his focus to look at who this God is. Look at what he has done. Um, he's beyond our comprehension. His wonders are amazing. We cannot draw up our case because of our darkness, Elihu says. So I think he's also pointing to the way that um, could Job point to, I haven't broken the Ten Commandments if they had them yet. He was actually predates Moses probably. But, um, you know, he hadn't killed anyone. He hadn't committed adultery. There were a lot of things that looked good about Job that were truly good. He, he was living a moral life, and that was good. Um, but there is still this darkness that we just don't see well. And I think we, we don't even see well enough to sort of know when we're leaving that reality that I was talking about earlier, that, you know, like we can start moving off of it without knowing it because we don't see well. And, and so some of these ideas are that, that our suffering is what God uses to do a course correction. So it isn't even a correction like a punishment or a consequence for an action that you could track it to. But it's more like, and it's an odd way to do that, but that's, I think, a big part of what God does. So then so then God shows up. You probably know how the story ends. Um, he points to the wonders of his creatorhood. <laughs> And he goes through several chapters of listing all of the things he has created. <laughs> and what I find so interesting about that is well, a number of things. But one of the things that I find so interesting about that is that um, he doesn't answer Job. He doesn't say, well, here's the deal. Let me explain this to you. <laughs> because I know it's confusing. <laughs> and I know you feel like I'm not here at all. <laughs> I think in a way he is answering that one. <laughs> Um, because this is where he is, for real, is, are you there when the mountain goats give birth? Are you there when I send a thunderbolt through the clouds? Were you there when I decided that the ostrich would ignore her eggs and let things stamp on them and not have wisdom, and yet can outrun a horse and his rider? <laughs> like all these different mysteries he just he goes through one after another after another and that whole section is just so um, he and he's saying to Job the whole time will the fault finder contend with the Almighty so kind of like saying really <laughs> look at what I've done <laughs> you really gonna take me on and say that I've acted unjustly or that um, you know, I'm at fault here. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, it's really powerful that Job's response to that is, <laughs> it says he covered his mouth and he says, um, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. And then later he says, my ears had heard of you but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So, I, f I think that um, there's, there's two prongs. There's m more than that, I'm sure. But two of the prongs that I see in this, one is that suffering can be an odd and terrible kind of gift that shows us God. <laughs> because before God knew, uh, Job knew God, knew about him, had heard of him. But there's this very poignant thing of like, but now I see you. And what he had gone through between those two things was this tremendous suffering. Um, and then the other piece is, I think part of what God's message is to Job is, look at all this 
I've got this. Um, I did all this. I think I can do this too. So trust me. <laughs> and again, extremely difficult. Um, how do we live with that? How do we live with that? Um, so what do I make of the story of Job? A few things, a few observations. One is that um, suffering is confusing and painful and not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence to any particular sin that we've committed, yet also impacted by our inability to see clearly and to trust God when we are in pain. So it's, it's a mixture. It's not one thing, but it's a mix, and we don't respond well when we're in pain. Secondly is that um, God has purposes beyond what we can comprehend or imagine. And though we are tempted when our friend is suffering for any reason to say, um, there's a reason for this, there's always a reason for this, and then we look for the reason, and, and then we, we might even think we find the reason, and we say, maybe that's the reason. You know, I mean, we still do this. And I don't know that we're going to know the reasons. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do think that Job also offers us a picture of a very merciful God who, in his response to Job, after all of that contending, um, basically says that um, Job spoke right of him. At the very end, it says that God says to his friends, he says, you guys did not speak right of me like my servant Job did. And I don't know if that means like the whole way that was true in the story or if by the end with Job saying, now I get it, now I see you, and his friends maybe didn't, maybe that's what he's saying is you didn't respond like my servant Job. But he vindicates Job. And to me, that's a tremendous encouragement because of my own um, wrestling. It's, um, I feel like it gives me permission to wrestle. It gives me permission to ask hard questions and to, um, I, I sometimes I feel uh, the story that is probably the most poignant for me is the one of Jacob when he wrestles with the angel or with Jesus maybe um, in the desert and walks away limping. <laughs> I'm grateful that I have often walked away limping, <laughs> um, but I have certainly wrestled, and I will continue. I'm a wrestler, so that's what God's working on. Um, another observation from the story of uh, Job, I think, is that God does offer correction through our suffering, whether it's this course correction. It might not be about a particular sin, but it is about um, pointing us to things that are more eternal and things that, um, that we learn uh, through our suffering, um, what's valuable and what's not in a, from a more eternal frame. Um, so it points us toward things more eternal, and if we can turn toward him in repentance, which I think means another, again, a course correction, whether it's about um, a moral course correction or a perspective course correction. Um, I can understand the way that my, through, through the experience, those experiences, I can understand the way that my choices have impacted the consequences that I'm facing. That's a really important recognition is like, oh, I have choices to make and they matter. And if I make these choices, they go this way. <laughs> if I make these choices, they go a different way. Um, I can also update or revise my view of what's valuable in my life and what's not of ultimate value. Either way, I can see more clearly what is true and real about myself and about God. And lastly, um, I think another lesson from the book of Job is that God as creator can be trusted to be just and also to have this. He's got this. <laughs> uh, look at the created world, the wonders he's done. Um, look at beauty and mystery for healing and sustenance. This is where we find reality, <laughs> if you will, um, in Scott Peck's uh, version of it.
So what does this have to do with psychology and counseling and all this stuff? I'm going to switch gears, but any thoughts or observations, questions, discussion before I go forward a little bit? <laughs> I should have been there, huh? <laughs> One of the things that did come up in the discussion was that there was a sense in which some of the students felt like uh, the answer that is given, or at least the way that we were interpreting it, which is similar to the way you're talking about it, uh, was that um, there was this, almost this pseudo-arbitrariness of God coming down and causing Job all this suffering. Yes. And, and, and Job then is going, why, why is this happening to me? And God's answer is, I am the creator of the universe. That's it. And yeah. people felt like that was kind of unsatisfying. Unsatisfying? Unsatisfying. Yeah, what was unsatisfying about that? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you know, we talked about that a little bit, but I'm curious, yeah. you know, what your, what your thinking yeah. is on, mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that, is that what we said? I think that's what, that's what I remember us saying. Mm -hmm. That's what Jonathan that's what said. John said. <laughs> Yeah, good. Um, yeah, I think that that's one of the big questions that comes out of this book. Is is God really that arbitrary? Um, I I think that I would answer that with, um, on a certain transcendent level, yes, he is. And it's not particularly satisfying because it's, it's pretty, um, I mean, I picture Job, you know, putting his hand, okay. <laughs> It's like, I think whenever we're confronted with how big God is and, and how much of a creator he is and how much of a creature I am, it's difficult <laughs> because I'm a creature. I don't get to say what happens to me. Um, I don't get to say whether or not he's arbitrary or not, but I get to respond to it. And I think um, that's where uh, we see who he is and who we are, and that becomes a valuable thing to wrestle with that very thing. So that's one way I would answer that. Um, another more maybe technical way would be to talk a little bit about, and we don't have to do this here, but um, some of the research I did on the Book of Job a long time ago, actually I led that discussion a couple times way back when. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you set it in its historical context, there was a particular view of the gods and the created order and that kind of thing. And so there, there's maybe a component of that too where the God of the Bible is showing up in a different way than the, the, arbitra the gods who that culture believed in were far more arbitrary <laughs> than this God. <laughs> and, um, and I think in the story that unfolds um, over the course of the Old Testament with um, Abraham and then Moses and then come all the way to Jesus. It's like this progressive revelation of who God is and then Jesus shows up. And so that's another piece that they didn't have in writing this book, if that makes sense. Um, I think we have the, the benefit of um, having been after Jesus <laughs> because that's who God was when he showed up. And there was nothing but compassion and certainly there was judgment of um, hypocrisy, um, but, but there wasn't, but there was kindness and love and mercy and humility. So anyway, Bob, it looks like you want to say something. Well, there one of my favorite verses is in Proverbs. It's the fear of the Lord, Yahweh, is the beginning of wisdom. and. Yes. I, I come back to that. We have this natural human tendency to want to figure stuff out. Why does this happen? Why did God do this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's right. natural, and we all have it. But but when we get to the end of all of our uh, ruminating and calculating and figuring, mm -hmm. there often comes a point where we just have to say, God is God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and if we can rest mm -hmm. in that, mm -hmm. whether or not we can figure all this other stuff out, mm -hmm. which we normally can't, 
-hmm. To me, that just gives me a, a foundation. Yeah. It gives me a place to uh, to rest, to yes. say, mm -hmm. God is God. And I've got this. I mean, I think that's yeah, what he I've was saying in, yeah. in reflecting on all of his exactly, creation. Exactly. It's like, hey. W whether or not you know mm -hmm. what's going on, Yes. I've got this. Exactly. So exactly. that's been mm -hmm. helpful to me. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's part of why when we try to help each other by figuring out what the reason is for this thing that just happened or, you know, um, I think it can really ring hollow, especially for the person that's f feeling the pain of it. It's like, so that was a good enough reason. I mean, you know, that's kind of our, our <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, maybe that's not, I mean, wh I think it's just bigger than that. And I think that's part of what Job really helps us know and what you're saying. It's like his, what El Elihu says is his purposes are way beyond us. And I think he was the, the most wise of the human responders in the book. I found his response just really fascinating. Yeah. So he kind of says you're both right and you're both wrong. <laughs> but anyway, good. Anybody else? sitting here with all kinds of thoughts running around in my head. That's a dangerous thing. Um, I'm not sure I think God is arbitrary because if anything, God is purposeful. From our perspective, mm -hmm. I'm sure it feels arbitrary all the time mm -hmm. to all of us. Mm -hmm. But it's all his purposes coming to fruition. And when I think about suffering, I reflect on C.S. Lewis' problem of pain. And I'll quote it, but I'll probably mess it up, so correct me. When he says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, and shouts to us in our pain, that he is, yeah. pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. And that's how he gets our attention, because he kind of got to slap us upside the head sometimes, because otherwise we just go merrily along and don't pay any attention and feel like we don't need him. Mm -hmm. I saw um, a man today when I, I was doing a psyche val, and I asked him if he'd ever had counseling. And he said, yes, and I'm done with that. I said, oh, what happened? His son had committed suicide. And he went to a counselor, and in the first session, he talked about blaming himself. And the counselor said, oh, you absolutely can't do that. And I thought, oh, how, what a horrible thing to say. And I apologize for our profession, because sometimes people do things that, yeah, um, that was really painful for him on top of the blame and the grief. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we need to just, again, not take that pain away. Yes, yes. And I want to just repeat that. That was something that Paula brought up at the end last time that I think is so important, is that, w and it's what, it's what struck me in Job's account where his three friends sat with him for seven days, not speaking. It's like, we so want to take each other's pain away, but our pain is what is going to teach us. And, and, and the company of connectedness and compassion in the midst of that pain is incredibly healing and incredibly helpful, but not to take it away, um, but to be in it together, I think is a very powerful balm. So, yeah, thank you. I want to... Um Piggyback on that. Oh, sorry. Did you want to say something? Yes. You sure? Uh, one thing that occurred to me as we were going through our discussion today on Job was that maybe there's a sense in which the suffering of Job was a fantastically merciful act on the part of God in the following way, that through the suffering, Job does learn something. He learns mm -hmm. that that um, that God is is not required to give an account in some sense of himself and that that it is somewhat kind of a hubris to expect that God is going to explain to me mm -hmm. what's going on and why I am suffering and, and to give an account of himself in some sense. And if you ask yourself, and that's an important lesson I think that Job needed to learn. He needed to learn that he's a creature and God is God. And that he's not as great as he, you know, as he sort of makes himself out to be. Mm -hmm. And if you think about where he was with 
however many donkeys and sheep and everything else that he had and family and all that kind of stuff. Was there any way for him to learn that mm -hmm. without suffering in some mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. although it's incredibly painful, it's an incredibly painful thing to experience and nobody would want to go through it and nobody yeah. would want it on anybody else. Mm -hmm. In God's economy, if you will, learning the truth about God is far more important than in some sense the the worldly pleasures and the things that we could mm -hmm. we could gain here in this world and so if god uses the means of worldly pleasures and and, and valuables and things like that to teach job something really profoundly true about god then isn't that in some sense a mercy i don't know that's one thought absolutely i agree mm -hmm. <laughs> I loved what you said about um, being grounded in reality or, mm -hmm. or being diligent mm -hmm. about reality. And I can think of um, a situation where, you know, oftentimes I can imagine into a situation, I think, well, I could never do that. You know, I could never tolerate that. Mm -hmm. But when um, I have been leveled in my life, mm -hmm. it, it is a, an experience that I don't have words for. Because it goes beyond anything I've imagined. It goes beyond anything that I can tell you. You know, I, oh, I think I'm going to, you know, I can, I can um, say what a, how I think I'm going to act in a situation. But I can think of one particular situation that happened. And, and I don't know, I embodiment of prayer, maybe that is it. I don't know what it is, but I know that how I saw God was in the reality of the circumstance. Mm -hmm. And believe mm -hmm. it or not, I mean, I, being in, a, in the present moment, being unable to be anywhere else, the pain was so great. I couldn't be anywhere but present. Mm -hmm. And as, as the suffering went on, as the, the moment by moment thing went, that I passed through, I started to see how people had come into my life unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. um, somebody would come and just do something. And I thought, I started viewing the everyday act of mm -hmm. kindness as a miracle, mm -hmm. little miracles that got me through mm -hmm. this. And so when I looked back um, l much later in my life, I viewed that as, as a period of time that was one of the most beautiful mm -hmm period of time in my life mm -hmm. that, believe it or not, I would not have traded that suffering, um, I don't know if I'm saying this right, I wouldn't want to go through it again, but I wouldn't trade what I gained from that and, and the goodness and the compassion and the love that I experienced mm -hmm. that I paid attention to because it was so healing for me at the time, just mm -hmm. little increments of you know kindness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even to this day, mm -hmm. I think of it often and, and yeah. what a gift it was. That was God. Mm -hmm. That was the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, all I could see that moment by moment. And right. what it certainly did was uh, um, um, expand. I, I taught me more about trust. Mm -hmm. So that's... Yes. And so it sounds like the trust came through when in this terrible circumstance and in the pain, God showed up in all of these different miraculous ways. Yeah. And, and you can look back on that and go, God showed up. Yeah, Is that kind God of showed up. That kind of I what you're saying? You still go through fear. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know, the day to day. But, <laughs> right. uh, but yes, right. in moments like that yeah. and, and certainly mm -hmm. other times in my life where, you know, mm -hmm. don't tell me how to pray or how to do this when I feel like I'm the embodiment of prayer, that my very yes. being is in base is I'm, in reality, right there, That's reality. can't go anywhere else. Yeah. But he's got my back. Yeah. Oh. You know. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, I was going to come back to um, how counseling fits in. I think we're kind of circling it. Um, because I think that um, 
uh, well, I'll, I'll start back. I'll go back to my mother. I, I mentioned that um, the progression of my mom's uh, grieving experience took her into a pretty deep depression for a number of years. Um, and, and maybe that's where um, kind of what we're talking about. It's like there isn't a, an explanation or, you know, she wanted an explanation for why my brother was taken. Um, she never got one. But when but that prompted in her a search, and she went through so many different, <laughs> she tried on all kinds of different beliefs and religions and um, some that were, you know, pretty wacky and she didn't last long in those gratefully but um but she was looking (laughs) and she finally landed in a place where she heard the gospel and something clicked for her and she um became a christian and really understood um i think for her whether or not she i think she did come to believe that it wasn't a punishment from god that steve died um but she also found mercy at the foot of the cross for all of her guilt. And isn't that what we all so need, is that kind of, um, that kind of mercy from God in Jesus and also from each other in the midst of our suffering. So um, a friend of hers, uh, after she um, had been a Christian, she was pretty early on in her uh, faith, she was sharing this experience with a friend of, of with a, a woman that she'd met through those circles and that was in a Bible study with her and and she listened with compassion and she finally said something like, So if what if God had said, You can have him but just for eight years <laughs> Would you have said yes? <laughs> Even knowing what you know now? And it was just obvious to her, you know, of course she would have said yes. But it it reframed the whole experience for her so that she could know this was a gift to me to have him, not a punishment that God took him away. And so that's part of what I mean by a course correction. It's like this this is a different understanding that she came to over many years of struggle. Um, And um, and so did her grief go away? I don't think you ever get over something like that to where it doesn't impact you. But she definitely gained perspective and she gained um, faith in the in the process of that. And I, I think that she might have even said, like you did, Kathy, that um, she wouldn't go through it again for anything. But looking back, she sees God in it. And she sees how God took her toward faith. And faith would be, I think she would be right now with us saying that was far more important (laughs) than not having suffered. And so that's really the direction and the goal that um, being dedicated to reality at all costs can can grant us is clarity of vision and um, ultimately wisdom in the fear of God and in um, understanding. So I do wanna go into a little bit, um, uh, I might chop this down a little bit, but um, I do wanna go into a little bit of um, counseling and what counseling can offer in the midst of suffering. We have feelings. We have emotions, we have sensations, we have an, a physical impact of trauma when it happens to our bodies. Like I talked about last time, I talked about the the zone of tolerance and activation and overwhelm and all the physical parts of trauma that happen. It was drawn here. I, you, I can't see it, can you? But it was here. <laughs> um, I won't draw it again because uh, that's okay. But um, but I also want to talk about kind of where our emotions fit into that, because we, we have a lot of feelings. Our feelings, I look at them as information. They are um, uh, kind of like lights on a dashboard. Um, when your gas light comes on, you know you've got about 30 miles. You can take your time, as long as you don't go more than 30 miles. But, <laughs> but you can go on over and, you know, get gas. Your oil light comes on, pull over. <laughs> right now and and so you know you you kind of know from these signals what 
uh, how you need to respond and how you need to ha- how you can navigate and so I think that's what our feelings can do for us which is different than so in in my um, I'm old so in my uh, generation I think that we struggled a lot with giving ourselves our feelings we grew up kind of you know that whole um, I grew up very WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You don't have feelings. You know, everything's fine, which is part of what was very impactful about losing my brother as a child and, like, never talking about it. Um, So that was the culture. I think that, um, and so for me, a very big part of my journey into this field and into life has been feelings are really valuable. They're really important. and it's really important to validate feelings and to know what they mean and to follow them and to let them be the information that they are. I still very much stand by that. That said, I think the generation that has come behind me has figured out how to have feelings and maybe in a way um, is a little bit driven by feelings. <laughs> and and so uh, and on the other side of the spectrum isn't as good at like navigating what does this feeling mean we can instead i think and this is a human thing i mean i think it can happen to all of us but i think just culturally it's been kind of a shift as well where um we just we have to follow our feelings like i had a feeling i gotta go do this thing, <laughs> you know? and i don't think that's good either <laughs> so but i do really support the idea that our feelings are information and we ignore them at our peril, we let them drive us at our peril. (laughs) And so um, to really understand kind of what we're made up of, um, that we have a mind that includes a lot of different things. It includes cognition and emotion. It includes sensation. Um, It includes the, you know, fight flight part back here. It also includes um, our will. Uh, it includes the Spirit of God at work in us um, and around us. We are very complex, um, intricate beings, <laughs> and um, and we respond to things that uh, events and occurrences and relationships. We respond in particular ways, and the ways that we respond create a set of lenses, in a way, if you will, that we then see through and and interpret our lives and so our feelings can help us learn what is it that I believe (laughs) about that experience I just had when I had this big reaction if I can back up and say what did that mean to me (laughs) why did I react so strongly just then what was that feeling telling me I think a really helpful use of of our emotions and a very God-given use is for us to listen to that and say oh and I don't, again, I don't mean it's like a one-to-one correspondence. Oh, I know. I felt that because of this thing and that, you know, we can trace it back maybe. But more than that, it's like it exposes to us, oh, I have a belief about something that may or may not be accurate or may or may not still serve me. And, um, and I think a lot of counseling can be very helpful for having somebody outside of you notice what those things are with you and help hold a mirror up so that you can see yourself more clearly. So that's part of what I think a really good use of counseling can be. So our feelings don't determine our choices, but they can certainly inform our choices. They're information about us, about our experience, about what's happened to us. Um, They develop these filters that I'm talking about. They can also be radar. So if I've had particular experiences, I might have a certain awareness that a person next to me doesn't have and that's really helpful (laughs) it's like something's not right here (laughs) and I can have these intuitions and I think the the more we can learn to really listen to those things and then separate like okay is that my radar because something's really weird going on here or is it my filter that's saying something weird's going on here because I'm used to something weird going on does that make sense and so part of our work is untangling that is like, how do I listen to my own experience and also learn (laughs) um, when it's misinforming me, if you will. Um, So God has given us these tools for navigating our lives. I also want to make a little comment, a side note, maybe we could have a whole talk on this probably, but um, on the role of choice and self-worth. 
that our worth as humans, I talked earlier about eudaimonia um, and our telos, um, I think that our worth as humans comes from fulfilling that telos, um, which is moral goodness, virtue, kind of becoming bigger. I love, s s speaking of C.S. Lewis, I love um, The Great Divorce, where um, when he takes the bus into heaven and hell, and the people in hell are, you can see through them. <laughs> They're like vapor. <laughs> Dante does this too. Dante does it brilliantly in the inferno. Um, but then in heaven, when, when the bus goes to heaven, people are becoming more and more solid and stable. And, and I just see that as such a great picture of like when we become who we are, <laughs> who, we are who are we are becoming, we get more and more solid. <laughs> we get more and more human is what I would say. It, and that doesn't mean hard. Solid doesn't mean hard. Solid means squishy and compassionate <laughs> and, and yummy and clear, though. Clarity and um, good. <laughs> so that's for later. Probably not in this life. Definitely not in this life. But, um, but it will come. And as we pursue that, our worth grows. And so our choices really impact that journey. Um, when we do things that align with that telos, we build our internal intrinsic sense of our worth. It just works that way. <laughs> when we do things that don't align with that telos, we erode that internal intrinsic sense of our worth. And, um, and I work with this a lot with the people that I meet with in my office because when, um, when people are in a lot of pain, we don't always make good choices. And so one of the things that I sometimes work with, um, just to give an example, um, I always make up examples, so I'm not um, revealing anything, but I do composites, so just so you know, this is a composite. <laughs> but, um, but someone that I work with um, that was deeply depressed and, and just couldn't get out of bed and um, we were trying to figure out ways to help her get out of bed and um, and and one of the the suggestions I made was what if when you're lying in bed do you have a window you can look out of and she did so she had the window open and she could look out of the window and see a tree that was a beautiful tree so I said just turn and look at that tree and that was movement so that was a better choice than pulling the covers over her head. So even a choice on that level, because that is movement toward life in a way, I mean, that's kind of a metaphor maybe, but, um, and it's just a small beginning, but it's a picture of what I'm talking about, that the simplest thing you can do that is in, in this direction <laughs> is going to really be helpful <laughs> and over time she was able to get out of bed more and more and the more she b realized that um oh she actually likes it when she does this thing she she learned that she really liked gardening and she got her hands in the dirt a lot and that became a real resource for her and it became something that was like she felt more like herself when she was doing that and so I, to, to make an extreme example perhaps, she felt more like herself, she, over time, she felt more like herself doing that than when she would stay home and find a way to cut herself. And, and so when she did that instead, she felt far worse about herself. And it, it would compound this not being able to get out of her bed, right? But when she started to look out the window, when she started to get her hands in the dirt, she could actually do this instead and she grew, she started to grow a person, I guess is kind of how I want to say it, you know. She started to grow some resource and some ability to make different choices. And um, she still struggles, um, but she's doing a lot better. So, um, so that's uh, an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so another quote by Lewis, love him. Um, I'm not sure the reference of this one, maybe you know it, but he says, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. 
And I think that's true. I think that the choices that we make really matter. So um, can counseling psychotherapy help in this process? And if so, how? Um, first of all, there's lots of choices about what kind of counseling you get. <laughs> lots of choices. And um, Paula gave an example of some that isn't good. And unfortunately, there's a lot of those examples out there. Um, there is, this is something I wanted to draw a little bit. And that is a continuum. I just kind of did that thing. Is that okay? Almost knocked it off. Okay. So, so there's kind of a continuum in the field um, between what we would call psychodynamic. Paula will tell you all about this next week. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <talk about> <laughs> and the continuum goes all the way to behavioral. And, and so there's lots of different kinds of counseling along the way between those two things. And um, you'll learn a lot more about that next week, I have confidence. But um, my goal in saying this is that um, when we talk about seeking truth or feeling better, I have a bias that heading this way on that continuum is going to be more helpful. <laughs> um, what I don't mean by that is this is never helpful because it is. It's actually quite essential at times to stabilize people, to get people, kind of like what I was talking about last time, you have to help people feel better on a certain level before they can do the hard work of moving toward reality. And so, um, but what I find, and I've met with a number of people over the years who had this kind of approach only, and they, they come into my office and say, why have I never been helped before? And it's like, because they've done this over and over again. <laughs> I've been to 10 counselors, and nobody's ever done this, you know? So this is really big out there these days. And, um, and it's also quite reimbursable by insurance. Um, it's also quite, uh, you can use medication a lot. <laughs> I mean, you can use medication anywhere, but um, to, to good ends. But, um, but it's kind of like, I think of it as if you only do that, you, you aren't really going far enough to really make substantial change. And so that's my bias. I'll just admit it. <laughs> um, so that's a continuum that you want to look for. There's also something that you want to look for. Um, and I, I just want to, I won't go into a lot of this because I think Paula will do a lot more on it. But um, there's a lot of different stuff out there. There's, there's this continuum, then there's, there's lay counseling that's offered by a lot of churches, where the, whether it's groups or, you know, like divorce recovery groups or addiction recovery groups. Or, and then there's the secular recovery groups. There's all kinds of support groups that's kind of based on lay counseling or people who are not trained professionally but have a lot to offer um, as peer counselors, and that can be super helpful. Clinical counselors, which is... Um, where Paula and I fit in, um, are um, trained uh, with a more, uh, I don't know, it's a broad approach. Um, there's a lot that I could say that is helpful about that and a lot that I think is not so helpful. Um, but, um, but there's also, so there's clinical counseling from a secular worldview. There's clinical counseling from a Buddhist worldview. There's clinical counseling from a biblical worldview. <laughs> there's, there's, um, and there's also uh, people sometimes ask me, uh, are you a Christian counselor? And I will say, um, I'm a counselor who's a Christian, um, but I always want to distinguish between something out there that's called biblical counseling, which is a movement started in the 70s, I think, early, late 60s, early 70s by Jay Adams. And, um, and it's a, a pretty big deal in Christian circles. And um, I would put them over here on the spectrum and also say that um, they want to use scripture in a very um, kind of rigid way, I guess. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to make this all about biblical counseling, but I think it is an important thing to know that's out there if you're looking for a counselor. That um, biblical counseling is um, kind of all about finding the sin and repenting, and figuring out how to line up your life with scriptural principles in a pretty behavioral way, and. Um, 
And again, I, what I think is good about what they're saying is that I think there is a moral component to what we struggle with. And that's completely missed in secular um, psychotherapy and counseling for the most part. Um, when I was in school 20 years ago, um, there was a book that we read. I can't think of the name of it now, but it was this really big controversial book about the moral nature of psychotherapy. <laughs> And uh, it was from a secular perspective, but it was kind of like, we've got to start bringing morals back in. And there, there wasn't really any basis for those morals um, from a secular perspective, but we just know that people do better with them. <laughs> it's kind of the approach of this book. And I just thought that was so interesting, and I can't agree more. I think that is really <laughs> helpful. <laughs> so, um, so that's what I like about biblical counseling, but I don't like that it, too often it's kind of using the Bible to find behavioral solutions. And, um, and I, yeah, I, there's a lot that I don't like about it, but we don't need to get into all that. Um, part of it is back to what Larry said in the first week um, when he talked about the verse, the beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. I think the real danger in that kind of approach is, oh, if I just do these things, if I just get this right, then I won't suffer. And um, two things are wrong with that. First of all, it's not true, <laughs> big thing. And second of all, I think it can create Pharisees because if I get it right and things go well, <laughs> I got this, right? <laughs> and that is um, hypocrisy in the sense of what Larry was talking about. It's playing a role. It's acting out a part because that is also not true, <laughs> that you've got this, <laughs> no matter who you are. <laughs> I will say that. We don't got this because <laughs> we are messy and broken. Um, okay, so, so, okay, I'm getting there. Um, that said, doing the good thing, which is in support of our telos of moral virtue, can indeed help us feel better um, and build our self-worth. Yet, of course, we still struggle, and because we don't see well, it's often hard for us to know what the good thing is. So how do we choose the good thing if we can't really see what the good thing is? Um, sometimes it's more obvious, sometimes it's not as obvious. Um, but... Uh, as we seek goodness from above, uh, we can find a road that can lead to greater health, greater mental health. Um, so concluding my stories, um, my mother, she was able to come to peace with God. She didn't lose her, her grief entirely. Um, and certainly my family's, uh, the impact of my brother's death is still, it still reverberates. Um, last weekend, what's today? 17th, 11 days ago, was the 60th anniversary of my brother's death. Um, and my brother, who lives, and I um, have over the years reflected on that. I have often, I always know the date when it shows up, you know, when it comes, um, but I don't often have it impact me. I just kind of acknowledge it and go on many years. Some years it hits me because that's how grief works. You know, some, some years it, it's more powerful. This was a Saturday, and um, and I realized it was that day, and then I thought about what year it was. I was like, wow, it's 60. And it really impacted me because of just that number was like so big <laughs> for one thing because I'm old. But, um, <laughs> but uh, still knowing that. And so my brother and I ended up connecting about it and talking. And, and I said, you know, this is one of those days where I wish I could. My, and my brother and my parents are all buried in Kentucky because that was their home. That was their um, birthplace. And... Um, and I said, this is one of those days I wish I could just go take flowers to the grave, you know, but it's too far away. And my brother said, let's do it. I'll go in on it with you. And I was like, you can do that. <laughs> you know, I never even thought about ordering flowers for a grave that no one will ever see them. Um, and we did. So we sent flowers to my brother's grave. And he lives in North Carolina, my other brother. So we sent flowers in Kentucky. And I did call my 85-year-old aunt, who's the last uh, sibling of my father's, um, and told her about it. And she said, well, I'm going to go look at him. I'm going to go. So I don't know if she did, but she wanted to. So, And she drives. She's like good. She could do it, totally do it. 85, 86. She's crazy. Um, but anyway, that was... Um, so I don't know. I just say that story to conclude that... Um, 
suffering shapes us and it uh, expands us and it um, and it gives us perspective that is extremely valuable um, over time. I think I closed last time with the quote from uh, Solzhenitsyn about um, bless you prison for having been in my life for it's there that I learned that life is not about prosperity as we've been told but about the development of the soul. And he learned that in the gulag. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so good counseling will be helpful if in a setting of support and care I am challenged to see things about myself that may be painful or difficult for me to see. If I merely want to feel better, okay. But if I want to seek truth, it's this truth about myself that I ought to be seeking. And this will often result in helping unstick stuck patterns t and finding substantial healing for our wounds, growing us into people who can take responsibility for our lives and choices. Um, I'll close this time with a quote by St. Teresa of Avila. She's the one that started the Carmelite nuns, who, by the way, have a convent right outside of Eugene. Never knew that till like a year ago. Um, St. Teresa said, be brave and walk through the country of your own heart. So I'll leave you with that. Be brave. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? We do have time for more discussion. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. Uh, I think I see a perspective in our culture today where people get it partly right. They say, like, I've suffered or I ex I've experienced pain and therefore I've grown. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if there's a movement to um, to like leave out that middle step of I've mm. chosen how to respond to it and I've grown. Because um, <coughs> I wonder if people are just saying, because suffering happened to me, I didn't have to make any choices or do anything. I'm just, I'm just better now because of it. So could you comment on mm. that? Like if you've seen mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because um, it's I'm kind of spinning with all the different possibilities because in some ways, um, some people don't, well, okay, so actually I want to read um, that quote by Elihu that um, I think is significant. Um, if I can find it here quick. Right, uh, this is in uh, chapter 36, verse 11 and 12. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment, which I read eudaimonia, not like wealth. Um, but if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. Um, It's not politically correct for me to say this, but I do think that there are two kinds of people at the end of our lives. And one kind has decided to look at the truth, square in the face and work with it. And the other kind has decided to um, make up a different reality for themselves. And I think that um, there are people who are destined for real life and people who are destined for destruction. Um, so, uh, and I don't know who they are, by the way. <laughs> I really value the story of the wheat and the tares. And like, the harvest hasn't happened. I don't know. So I'm just working at this level. Um, but, but I think that you make a really good point that our choices have a lot to do, the way we respond to suffering has a lot to do with whether or not we grow from it. And I think that's kind of what El Elihu is saying is that um, if God gives us perspective and uh, clarity, then we will make it through the suffering and we will have perspective and growth and wisdom. Now. Oddly enough, I know a lot of people I've seen, I've worked with people who don't claim faith at all, and, um, and yet who have that same experience. 
um, they grow from suffering. Um, sometimes they um, do that. They certainly make better choices like the person I was talking about who found um, ground, uh, dirt to be a resource. Um, but, there, but there really hasn't been any move toward any kind of faith there. And, and so that is why it, my answer to your question is complicated <laughs> because I just think we're so complex. And so in my work, I'm moving her toward reality. Whether or not that turns into faith is n not in my hands. Um, and so I'm not sure how well, I, I think it's an important observation that you make because what we miss, and maybe this is really what you're pointing to, is what we miss is that it, it's not A plus B equals C. It's, um, it's not suffering equals wisdom. It's suffering plus working with it <laughs> that equals wisdom. And if I choose instead what I would call like um, not working with it um, makes people perhaps into kind of permanent victims um, or kind of decides that instead of a, an internal locus of control, that's one of our clinical mental health terms, there's an external locus of control. In other words, that's why I'm like this. Instead of, ooh, this is why I'm like this. Kind of like Larry emphasizes over and over again that until we face into that we are our own worst problem, we will make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And, and so, um, I don't know if that addresses at all what you're talking about. I actually think it's a really important point because we do completely overlook that. And we overlook that if I don't respond to it well, that I'm going to keep adding. In fact, um, as I, if I make choices that don't align with my telos, um, then uh, I'm going to add pain. I'm not going to come out of suffering well. <laughs> I'm actually going to add more. Um, and I see that so often, and, it, and it's really heartbreaking, because it's like, you're, um, I, I knew someone recently who said, um, who called that, um, well, never mind, it's kind of vulgar, so I won't say it, but it's basically um, not respecting your life and, and doing harm to your life <laughs> by continuing to make choices that are um, in opposition to our telos. That's my politically correct way of saying that are morally broken. <laughs> so any, anything more that you would like to add to that? Yeah, but not right now. Okay, <laughs> Thank okay, you. yeah, you bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Real quick. Um, a lot of times when people get older, and mm -hmm. I, I think of being in reality and moving forward, making choices, what mm -hmm. part does nostalgia play hmm. in relieving suffering? Hmm. Wow. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I actually just read a long article about, um, I think it was in, maybe it was in the New Yorker. I can't remember. It was a long article about um, the philosophical basis of different models of dealing with um, dementia and Alzheimer's in later life and uh, like different kinds of care models for, for dealing with that. And there's a big move now to, or there has been recently, to kind of go with people's imagination, like, or their older memories, or like they're starting to put bus stops in front of nursing, um, in front of memory care homes in case somebody wants to go home. They just say, okay, go wait for the bus. And they kind of like build up this fantasy for them. And, and that's because before that, it was, no, you can't remember, you live here. There, uh, there was always this pull to like, no, be here now. And that was terrible for people. <laughs> um, it didn't, it wasn't helpful. And so now there's a bit of a backlash happening about this movement that says, yeah, but do we really want to just help people live in a fantasy? Um, and I think at a certain point in the progression of dementia, yeah, probably. I mean, I think that might be kinder. But... Um, so that's kind of where my mind went when you asked that. But I think that um, 
I think that nostalgia, the way I think of nostalgia is kind of a fondness for what's gone past. And, um, and I think we want to look at our past experiences with, um, I think uh, looking at them fondly is great. And I also think we want to bring a real frame to them. So in other words, there was also pain there. And, and this is what I learned from that. And, and so it's like, it's a mix. And I think what we can tend to do with nostalgia is kind of paint everything with a really rosy color. And, um, and I think that feels good. Um, but in living life in the present, we get to know that um, some of it is really lovely and some of it is really hard. So I don't know if that answers your question, but those are some of my thoughts as I consider it. Yeah, yeah. This is maybe really off topic, but I'd be interested in your comments. And if it's being covered later, that's fine. Um, I'm very interested in your... Mm, whatever you want to say about narcissism. Mm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Just in general. Okay. Um, might be covered later. Just a little bit, okay. Um, narcissism is, um, there's a, a diagnostic category of um, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, that that might be what you're referring to, and people who are diagnosed with that um, have a tendency toward um, seeing themselves with as great, and they have kind of two parts of themselves. Um, they can split back and forth between them, where to be in their presence and to be have their light shine on you is fantastic because you're the center of the universe because they're kind of projecting their own center of the universe um, in that sense. Sorry, who's the center of them or you? Them, them, but they're putting it on you and so it feels really good <laughs> to be the recipient of that. <laughs> it's like, this feels really good until it doesn't and, um, and then it can switch to um, if I contest that view of them or if I have a different opinion or you know a different perspective then that can kind of switch and then you're the worst thing in the world and there's often a lot of self-hatred and that's also a projection from that person anyway it's complicated but um but we do live in a culture where it's becoming more and more um prevalent uh, apparently there's statistics uh, I heard recently I don't I won't quote them correctly but um but in the last 20 years, there's been a really big increase in um, the incidence of narcissistic personality disorder. And um, some people trace that to, like I was talking about last time, um, children go through a very natural process of development and, um, and narcissism is a part of that development in a way. Kids, um, everything's about them, right? And then they move through that and, and parents help them figure out that it's not all about them, <laughs> that they're a part of a bigger system, and that can be very supportively taught to children. And so some people trace the uh, increase in narcissism to uh, the breakdown of the family because um, kids aren't getting what they need uh, often, and so they, if they don't get filled up with something, they kind of increase that thing and kind of keep it going, I guess, I don't know. It's complicated. But, but um, I can point you to a couple books that might be interesting. If um, I read quite a bit about it, yeah. um, just but haven't particularly, mm -hmm. um, not from a clinical um, mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult to be in a relationship with people who are narcissistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we'll close with that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.